thanks a lot for having me. Um, it was a joy to come over here and especially talk to a, a room of fellow functional pro programming <coughs> and other languages uh, enthusiasts. Um, I have to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous because I have hardware demos and all, <laughs> all sorts of things can go wrong. But what we're gonna do is, uh, I have backup videos. Very good, <laughs> very important. We're gonna try like up to three times and then we're just gonna say no. And uh, everybody that's in the first row, okay, uh, you are gonna be my drone catchers for, for <laughs> going forward, okay? So uh, there'll be instructions on how to do this. Uh, it shouldn't be needed, but just so you know, if you're sitting in the front row, that is gonna be your job. All right. So um, I, I like to do uh, my presentations in the form of stories. Um, because I really like stories. I think uh, stories teach us, stories entertain us. Um, stories, I think, are a fundamental way that humans communicate information. So this presentation will have part of the story with it as well. And this story takes place a long, long time ago. It was a time before mobile phones. I know, it's crazy. A time before even personal computers. And in this time, there was an ordinary, completely ordinary five-year-old girl. And she was completely ordinary in every way until, until she watched an episode of Sesame Street. And you have Sesame Street over here, don't you? Or, okay, all right, just making sure. <laughs> and on this episode of Sesame Street, there was a robot. And this robot was called Sam, and it stood for Sam, the, well, the super automatic machine. And the girl was completely taken with this robot. She wanted it to be her robot friend. And in fact, uh, that's all she could talk about. I mean, to her mom was all about Sam and the robot, and everything had to revolve around Sesame Street now and drawing pictures of it, and in fact, she just stopped playing with her dolls. And she didn't stop playing with, you know, her stuffed animals. She stopped playing with her toys. She even got to the point when she stopped playing with her dog. And this is when her parents really started to worry. And it was an age where you just couldn't go out to, um, you know, the, the store and buy all these really cool computer toys and robots that you have today. Uh, you know, there was nothing like that available. But they loved their daughter, and they had to try to do something uh, for her. So they made her a wooden robot. Completely wooden, it had wheels, and it had a string that you could pull along. But the robot did one thing. It had one job that it could do in an automated fashion. And that was pick up nails or anything metal. It had a magnet on the bottom, and it could pick it up. And the girl loved this. This became her robot friend. And she dragged it around the house with her, she dragged it to the store with her, she dragged it to the library with her. It was her constant companion, and she loved it. But the years passed. She grew up, she became a software developer, she worked for quite a few companies, small companies, large companies. She learned quite a few computer programming languages, small languages, large languages, and she even had kids of her own. And she had completely forgotten about her robot friend until one day she saw a Roomba. And the wonderful thing about these Roombas, uh, they're just a marvelous design that to use it, you don't have to know anything about how it works. It's just got a big green button and you press it and it cleans your floor. But then on the other end of the spectrum, it's got an open API where you can actually program it and hack it in any sort of way that you'd like. So she looked at this and she thought, wow, could this be my robot friend? So she began to think, it could be my robot friend, but how do you talk to a robot? She start by thinking about her language choices. How would she talk to this robot? What language would she use? And it seemed to her naturally that she'd be lisp. And this is because of John McCarthy, who is one of the founding fathers of AI, 
And she figured, well, you know, if he thought that this would be good for AI, then if the computer or the, the Roomba has a natural language, then it probably should be Lisp. But she was a modern girl, and she wanted to have a modern Lisp. So she wanted to do it in closure. And uh, so now I'm going to switch to the first person, because um, the little girl is me, and this is like easy, then I get like confused. <laughs> so, <laughs> So let's, uh, so let's take a look at what makes closure, I, I think, a great language for doing this. It's dynamic language, and it's functional, and it has Java and Java and concurrency. We'll talk a little bit more about each one. So first, a uh, show of hands. Who in the room has closure experience? All right, quite a few. Okay. Um, so just uh, real quick, like, ooh, it's kind of stretched out text here, but that's all right. Um, it's a dynamic language, so here we're just defining a cat to be the string cat, but we don't have to say anything about what type it is or anything like that. Um, it's functional. Um, you know, here's how you do a simple say hello function in um, Clojure. So you define the uh, concatenate hello in the string and then actually call execute it, say hello Roomba. It's got Java interop. One of the really powerful features of Clojure is that you have access to all these wonderful um, Java language uh, libraries, and you can actually call the methods on the Java methods on them wrapper free. So in this case, you're looking at like a class of a Roomba, which is really just a Java lang string, and you can call to uppercase case on it there. <coughs> and of course, it's a really nice feature is concurrency. And it's got immutable data structures, and it's got these things called vars and refs and atoms and agents that work together for concurrency. I'm not going to go into um, all that right now, but it's very nice. So, back to the Roomba. The Roomba has a. Um, let me get it out here. So this is a Roomba. Everybody seen a Roomba before? Know about Roombas? No? Okay. They vacuum your floors. Awesome. But uh, you, they usually have a cover on it. But you'll see that each one of them comes with this port, this serial port, that you can plug in and send commands to through this specification. So this is their, their port. I'm going to put the Roomba here. And uh, you can connect to it via Bluetooth. So they have this thing uh, called a Rootooth, specially made for the Roomba. Here it is, a Rootooth. Very cool. Uh, you can order from Spark Fun, by the way. They're very good. And uh, there was this book called uh, Hacking Your Roomba, which was a very fun book. And the cool thing about it is um, they have a library that's already written in Java. Um, I'll go back to it. So there's a, already a library written in, in uh, Java called Roombacon. So because we have the power of Java libraries, I don't have to like rewrite that. I can actually have a closure REPL and talk to the Roomba using this library through closure, which is what I'm going to show you a demo of right now, which is great fun. So. Um, I know some of you might have trouble seeing the Roomba on the table. I'm going to show a short video of how it works later for the people in the back. So, hold on. Hopefully it'll work. Um, I had Bluetooth trouble when I tried to do this um, earlier today. So, but we have backup videos. It's all about the hardware, right? I warned you about this. Okay. So, going over to my Emacs here. Oh, wait. Before I do that, I have to actually try to connect to it. So system preferences, and then, oh great. Things are going wrong already. Oh, okay. See, I like freeze up here. Wait, where's the, the thing? Like, how do I get back to my? Oh. Oh, gather windows, okay. What? Control? Oh, show off. 
Thank you. See, I, like, I, I get up here, and I just get so nervous, I can't do things anymore, which is horrible. But Okay, so Bluetooth. Here it is. Pair. Please. Connecting. Connected. Pairing failed, but that's okay, because I have to put in the secret code. <laughs> <laughs> Now you all know my secret. Connecting. Connected. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here is uh, an Emacs with uh, closure REPL in it. So I can execute the commands, uh, I think, with control XE. Okay. So that's working. That's cool. So uh, first you de define your Roomba here. And uh, I'm actually calling that Java class, that RoombaCom serial from that library that we just saw. And I should see all the ports there. So you see it's kind of small text there, but that Firefly thing, that's the um, Bluetooth thing that we just got. I'm going to define a port name, and now here is the moment of truth. This is where it was failing me before. Connected true. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So we start up the Roomba, we can look at his mode of string, he's in a passive mode, we want to control him. So if it returns true, we're in good mode here, good. Okay, so we're going to play a note. It's kind of, do you hear it? And you can play, this tells you how long and what frequency to go with. So you guys hear that again? Yeah, okay. I think it's really cool. Okay. <laughs> So you can tell him to do things like spin left. So there he is, he's spinning around. And we can tell him to spin right. And you can tell him to like stop and stuff like that. I'm not gonna have him go forward because he's on the table. Um, you can even do things like turn his vacuum on. <laughs> this is actually my son's Roomba from um, his room. He, each of my children have a Roomba, so he's very excited. <laughs> he's, he's very, oh, I have my own Roomba too as well. <laughs> but uh, he's very excited that his Roomba is, is, is uh, come overseas all, all the way for you. So, um, so uh, of course, you can write functions to control the Roomba. So here's a function that I wrote to spin and beep. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of imperative stuff but here, but you and have to do sleeps with the, the Roomba. But it's all worth it because, you know, controlling your Roomba. <laughs> so this spins and beeps. Yay! Good Roomba. So he's, he's done his job. He's done his first demo. So I'm going to put him away because I'm very proud of him. And then I'll show a video for you, for you people in the back so you can kind of see. He'll be coming out again, and we'll see if he can behave himself like he did before, and that'll be great. So back to Keynote, and I will play it. Okay, so here's the backup video, and also that so that people can see in the back. Oh, I forgot my sound player. Hmm, I have a sound plugged in. Are you getting it now? No. Okay. Oh, there we go. So that's me with my Emacs ruffle there. And we had it in the office, and we were just having great fun with it. So uh, I, I recommend. So anyway, if, if, you, if you're going to get one, it can keep your floors clean and you can play with it and hack it, which is it's pretty fabulous. So it was happy times with the Roomba. And uh, we were getting along great. And then I saw this thing, an AR drone, a paired AR drone. And I thought, whoa, could this be my robot friend? <laughs> the answer is yes. So a little bit about the AR drone here. Um, oh, where did I put it? Oh, it's a black on the floor. 
Okay, and this is one of the important parts is that it usually has a hull that goes around it. It's a styrofoam hull to protect the blades when you're flying it inside. And I had was so proud of myself because I had brought both the Roomba and the Air Drone overseas, and I was on the underground by myself, which I hadn't done for the first time, and I found my way all the way to this stop, and I got off the, uh, do you call it an underground car, the train? I'm not sure. Okay, the tube. So I got off, and I was in the station, and I was holding the, a box with this in it and the hull on top, and the breeze came by from the train and just took the whole thing and went straight on the tracks. So, we are gonna fly hullless tonight. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> a little exciting, but this is a quadcopter. So it's got actually got two cameras. It's got one in the front, and it's actually got one on the bottom as well. And it's got sonar. Isn't this cool? So it can tell how far how far it is off the ground. Uh, again, beautiful design. You can fl you don't have to know anything about how it works. You can fly it out of the box connect to it with your iPhone or iPad, but on the other extreme, you can hack it to your heart's desire. It's got an open API. You can hack it in any language that you like. Uh, many people have, they see there's a Node library out there, there's a Ruby library, there's a Go library. I've written one in Clojure that we'll talk about in a minute. I don't think there's a Haskell one out there yet, so I'm just saying. So uh, anyway, it, it's great fun. Uh, so they're go hacking it. There is they publish an AR drone developer's guide, and uh, very well documented. And uh, I'm just going to show you walk through a little bit about how you actually communicate with it. So oh, I forgot to mention that it's got a wireless network actually on board. So when you start it up, you connect to its wireless network and you talk to it over an EVP channel and you send it commands, so that's how it works. So just walking through uh, just a sample program here, what you do in Clojure is you have like a namespace and then you import some Java libraries, very useful Java libraries you don't have, you don't have to rewrite, um, having to do with UDP communication. <coughs> the next thing you do is you define your actual drone host IP that you're gonna talk to and its default port. And then you have a socket of course, that you're gonna use with this. And there is just a send command function where you're sending it, and the thing that you're sending is just a string. You send just a string over UDP, and we'll see that in a minute. So you construct your datagram packet and you just send it to it. And here is a simple command for a takeoff and land. And you can see it's just a string you're sending over, it's got an AT ref in there. The thing after the equal sign is actually the sequence number so that you have to actually increment with each call or it won't listen to it if it's not higher than the little one before. And uh, just a return uh, character on the end and you can take off and land. And you can send it a command just like this. And <laughs> I was actually doing this just in the closure REPL one night and I had it like sitting here at my table and I was you know, after they put the kids to bed and I was hacking on it and it actually worked and I screamed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and my kids both woke up, came running out of their rooms, what's the matter, mommy? I'm like, oh my gosh, it worked, look, it's flying. So, um, so I ended up writing a, a library for it called CLJ Drone, it's out on GitHub. And um, so just extending those commands or some, all sorts of other things you can do with it. You can uh, take off, you can land. There's an emergency mode, and this is important because, as we'll see the safety instructions later, if it uh, gets an angle greater than 90 degrees, it cuts out, and uh, then you have to reset it and say, it's okay, you can fly again. Uh, spin right, spin left, up, down, tilt back, tilt front, turn right. You can give it a combination of these parameters and have it fly. <coughs> I, I, I tend to do this a lot when I'm talking about flying, but in any sort of position that you want there. Um, flat trim tells it that it's on the ground, so kind of stabilizes it before it takes off. And uh, reset watchdog, that has to do with the navigation data. When you're getting the navigation data, it'll only um, keep sending it to you if you tell it that you're still listening and you're still alive. So, lots of commands. 
The way that you execute them is I wrote a function drone that sends, you saw it earlier, uh, basically like that. You send it a key and you tell the drone what you want to do. All right, you guys ready for another demo? Yeah. Safety first, all right. <laughs> so um, this is an incredible safe product. I mean, they've done a really good job designing it. The blades are plastic. I have stuck my finger in the blades before and I still have all my fingers. I'm not gonna say it doesn't hurt. It does hurt, okay? But uh, it, it's a very safe product. Uh, I'm gonna show you, again, we talked about the engine cutoff, right? So uh, there's a certain way that you catch a drone if it's not doing what it should do, which happens, it's hardware demos, you're programming it, stuff happens sometimes. It shouldn't, but I want you to be prepared. So this is how you don't catch a drone. <laughs> okay? So especially with the hull, like if you grab it here and you you hit the blades, right? It's gonna hurt. He still has all his fingers and you know, it, it just hurt. So here is how you're supposed to catch a drone. So especially that's the hull there. You flip it. So in this case, it doesn't have the hull, but you can still get a hold of it this way. Or like if it's underneath, you can grab it underneath and then flip it like this, all right? Okay, and first row, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, Paul from Mio, he's also from Mio as well, he is gonna be this side of the stage, drone catcher. I'm gonna be this side of the stage. And, um, right. Oh, we're not to the backup video, we're not gonna use that quite yet. Um, so I need batteries. Now, you might notice that I put a lot of tape for the people in the front row. And this is because um, the drone gets into hover mode based on its vertical camera. So if you have a featureless floor or low light, <laughs> um, so this actually, I have a star and like a little thing. So this isn't anything special to the drone, it's just features. So it tries to, when it hovers, it'll try to orient itself and not shift too much. But if it gets on the black here and it can't see a place to stay in place, it might drift a little bit more, okay? So, hold on. I have to get back to my Emacs here and my other program. And I have drone moves. Okay, I don't want this. So again, this is, usually has a hull on it like you saw in the pictures, but we're going hullless today. It shouldn't make a difference. We'll see. Okay, um, the turn's green. Okay, so uh, then we have to connect to the network. And there it is, a Mio drone. You connect it to a hearing net. Da, 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 da. Yay! Okay, so we initialize the drone, and we're gonna do that flat turn we talked about to tell it's on the ground, and just for good measure, I'm gonna do the emergency, even though I don't really need to do it. And then we take off. All right, it's doing pretty well here. So we can do some moves here. They have some animations that they program in and we're gonna call them here. This is called a double phi theta mixed. <laughs> the little dance move there. This one's called a wave. Is it getting too close to you, Paul? All right. Okay, this one's a turnaround one. Um, okay, so here's the, the tricky bit. It's gonna do a flip. Okay, you guys ready? <laughs> so yeah, not having the hull on throws the weight off. Usually it kind of like bounces right back, but instead it hovers a little bit higher now. But um, yeah, not bad. So yay. Both my robots.
have been so cooperative now. So see if they can just keep it up. Oh, was that my backup video I was going? We don't need that. Okay, so uh, not only can you send the commands, but you can also get navigation data back from all these wonderful sensors on here. So again, you have the sonar that you can get uh, back and it's got other sensors so it can actually tell how fast it's going and it has these uh, cameras and of course you can do vision processing but it's actually got some pre-tags um, that it can look at. And some of them are tags, it's like stickers you can put on the hull of the other drones and, or on the, on, the, on the case. So those are one type of tag it recognizes. This is another type of tag it recognizes. It's called an oriented rondel. And you can programmatically decide which camera you're gonna look for these tags. So you can look for them on the vertical or on the horizontal camera as well. Uh, so the nice thing about those tags is they come in very fast. Uh, so you don't have to do your own vision processing and it can actually kind of estimate how far away you are from these tags, like the delta X and the delta Y, and it can tell you immediately when it detects it. And multiple, actually, tag detections, which is pretty cool. So uh, I gathered this sort of navigation stream data. You have to have another port that you connect to, and uh, it sends you back this data, and I, this is a closure atom called a nav data, and this will share the information across many threads. So all sorts of good streaming data you can get. It can tell you its control state. It can tell you if it's flying, landed, hovering, et cetera. Battery percentage, um, pitch, roll, yaw, um, altitude. And it, it's got some idea of its velocity, but you know it's not all that accurate. And then we talked about the vision, vision tag stuff as well. Uh, so here's an example of how you would use that. Um, you can log out. Uh, any information in that navigation data you're interested in. You would initialize the drone and then um, say that you want to target stuff. Uh, what things you want to target, you could look for those uh, stuff on the horizontal camera, those tags, and they have different color tags. And in case you want to be playing with different color drones, you have like blue tags, yellow tags, green tags. I could show you on the hull if I had it, but I don't. <laughs> or you can say that you wanted to look for um, the rondel on the vertical camera. And then you can call this function initiate nav data and you'll start to get all this data back streaming in in that nav data atom that you can look at. You can also do vision processing, your own vision processing. So the uh, video comes back to you in a um, TCP IP channel and it comes back in its raw stuff in H.264 format. Uh, you can go ahead and you can take that format and you can save it off to your own recorded video if you want to. You can display the raw feed in any way that you want to as well. Or, and this is kind of cool, you can take that um, video back and you can convert each frame to a PIN format that can go to another open source vision processing library, OpenCV. And you can do facial recognition. So this is my husband testing this out. <laughs> So uh, it targets a space coming in. It'll target, you know, it's using the the, uh, the face detection library. So it's pretty, the face detection library is, is pretty fast itself. However, doing all this processing on um, the video format is really slow, at least on my three-year-old air. So I'm not going to actually show that because it's actually like a, like a four-second delay, which is a little bit disappointing. I haven't figured out how to get that down. But... Anyway, you can do it, and you could do stuff like track balls, you could track laser pointers, um, you know, anything you want to, basically. But OpenCV has Java bindings, and because you have access to the JVM and all the Java libraries, you can use it, so it's very nice. So all this is really cool. Um, you know, you can control it, make it do things, but I thought, you know, if I really want this to be my robot friend, something's kind of missing. You know, I, it would be nice if it had beliefs and goals. <laughs> and uh, this isn't a crazy idea. I mean, John McCarthy wrote a nice paper about uh, ascribing 
mental qualities to machines. And he said that in, in cases, it can be quite useful to do this. Um, you know, a classic example of this is a thermostat. A thermostat can be said to have beliefs and goals. Not many, but it could, it could have some. So its beliefs would be, you know, the room is too cold. Or its belief could be the room is too hot. Or the room is just right. And it could have the goal uh, that the room should be just right. So why would you want to do this? Well, wh one of the things that uh, McCarthy said in his papers was that it could be easier to understand and reason about. I mean, this is how we relate to each other. I, um, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly what is going on when I'm looking at somebody, their blood um, sugar level and all the goings on in there. But, uh, but if they look like, or I hear their stomach rumbling, I can ascribe them the belief that I think they're hungry. I mean, that's, so maybe under, easier to understand or reason about in complex systems. And this could be a useful concept also for building intelligent systems. You know, our AI computer programs are gonna be incredibly complex to model human behavior. Maybe we should start kind of modeling it after how we think. Uh, so I started working on beliefs and actions for the drones. So here's an example of a belief action. It's called um, a belief action that's landed. It has a, a string, a human readable string, that I am landed. So it'll believe that I am landed when uh, it's got a function, a predicate function that evaluates to true. So you remember that navigation data control state? So when it sends back landed, then it will believe that it's landed and go ahead and do this action take off. Uh, another one, a belief action of taking off. It believes it's taking off when the control state gets into this state trans takeoff. Uh, and then once we have these belief actions, we can put them together and actually give it a goal. We can say that this goal take off, which a human readable string, I want to fly. So he can have the goal that he wants to fly. And uh, it compose, composed of these two belief actions, a belief action landed and a belief action of taking off. And um, yeah, that's hovering. So then you can change, uh, you can uh, chain these goals together so you can give it a goal list. So it can give the goals that you want it to take off, get to a cruising altitude, and then land. So let's try it. Um, so another kind of risky thing about this one <laughs> is that uh, it relies on that stream of navigation data coming back. And uh, have been other demos before when it's a noisy Wi-Fi environment that it just cuts out and it'll, it'll stop the stream because it just can't get the, the stuff fast enough. And I know it's not relying, right? Because I just have error handling on this case. But um, so if it, the navigation stream stops and it doesn't believe that it's ever high enough, that's a possibility that it could just keep going up. So that, that's one possibility. <laughs> I'm just letting you know here. Um, So we have a uh, goals here, drone nav goals. Okay. So here's the program, and it's got a whole bunch of these belief actions that we had before, and it's setting the current goal list like it did before. I'm just going to go ahead and, and execute this entire buffer here real quick. So it's got all its beliefs and goals in here. Oh, shoot. I want to have to do this again because it's not actually plugged in. It's not listening. Okay. Whoops. Wires. That could be really dangerous. Okay. Whoops. So we'll have to execute this again. I should have a log 
This should log his beliefs and goals, if I have the right log with him, so we can see. Okay, so he has all his goals. So now, when I initialize him and then hit that init nav data, he should just go and do this all on his own based on his own goals and beliefs and not me giving him the commands here. All right. Okay, so you see here, he's, oh, it's hard to see, oh, he's trying to get to a cruising altitude and he's drifting backwards. We'll just let him go for a minute. He'll be okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> you, come on, John Paul, are you all right? Are you okay? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh gosh, I told you this was gonna be fun. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, he got, he got uh, interrupted there. So uh, I think he got their emergency cut out. So that's as far as he got. Um, it wasn't quite a safe landing. But uh, you guys get the ideas there. there. So you can tell whether he achieved the goal. He never actually achieved the goal. And actually, um, I, the one thing that I found when I was working with doing these demos and or you know, just playing with it, and it actually was easier to debug. Like when he went up, and got stuck on the ceiling, I knew that he had a faulty belief that he was <laughs> high enough. So it made it, made it really clear. So, uh, back to here then. So we could do the backup video, but I, you guys saw enough of it, I think. Okay, so um, now I had an air drone. That's my friend. And I have a Roomba that's my friend. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if they could be friends together? <laughs> you know, it would kind of be like Wally and Eva. <laughs> so I uh, started working on a program for both goals and beliefs for both the Roomba and the drone as well. And I had this kind of idea that and this is the diciest demo of all. I, I couldn't even get this to work at all during lunch, but we're, we're just gonna try it and we have backup videos. So the idea is that the Roomba has this oriented roundel on it, right? I put a little Velcro on it, and it, it would sort of be like an old-fashioned movie where the Roomba would come out and be looking for his friend, and then the drone would take off, and the drone would be looking for its friend, and then they would find each other, and then the Roomba would sing the theme song from Wally. -E. <laughs> and then they would dance together. And then the drone would land on the Roomba. <laughs> so this is fabulous when it works. <laughs> and it's, I haven't actually got it to work in the live demo yet. But um, we will see. Today could be lucky. I'm going to move this table out of the way. This also requires setup. So for this one that is even more dicey than the rest, when we find, well, we won't even talk about that quite yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so first thing I need to do is I need to see if the Bluetooth will actually talk to the Roomba. Um, so I need to get to the Bluetooth thing again. Okay, so first I have to, it's fine, it's worse. Okay, I'm delete that one. And, um, right, Roomba has to go here, stage left, oops, I gotta put his thing on, and put the Bluetooth in, and we'll see if we can connect to him again. All right, guys, stop doing the Bluetooth stuff. failed. That's okay. Mm, I think this will work. Connected to it. Connected. Back to Emacs. This is the Roomba and the drone are friends namespace. And I've got to redefine the Roomba. And 
we'll see the ports are showing up. This is the dicey time of whether it actually connects again. This one goes, Arr! okay. So we're going with my plan B. I've never done this before either. Um, I am going to show you the, the video later of how it all works. But um, you're not going to be able to hear him sing his Wally theme song here, which is okay, but I'll, I'll, it'll be on the video. Um, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to have the drone initiate its takeoff sequence and try to look for it. And then I'm going to try to position him over this, and then I'll just take this thing off and then maybe have it dance around. But that's probably won't work. <laughs> but we'll try it. So for this case, um, I think if you're in the front row, you should really get ready. <laughs> um, so, let's see, we need to get the drone set up. I'm so sad I couldn't turn that phone again. Well. So how do we take off? So set up the drone, we're going to oh, we have to go to the network again. Okay, we're on the network again. So we've got to initialize them, emergency mode. Here we are initializing the targeting, remember? Uh, we want to target that rondel on the vertical camera, and we want them to hover on that rondel. And where's my land function? <laughs> okay, it's right down there. All right, just making sure I know this, all right? So I'm not going to send off the, the room because he's not talking, which is kind of sad, but we'll see if we can get him to find it anyway. And Paul, I'm going to actually grab it underneath, so don't, uh, unless it, don't grab it, yeah, okay, ready? Oh, hold on. Why are you not going? Hold on. There it is. So he should try to fly. He's like flying and trying to find them right now. So at this point, the Roomba would find him and he would kind of sing, right? And it would sing this nice put on your Sunday clothes song, which I'm not going to sing. And they would dance together like this. Okay, we're going to get back on the ground here. And they would spin around and dance, and then it would land. So I will show you the back of the room. <laughs> but you kind of got a flavor of it a little bit. Oh, wrong cracker. So OK, so here, here is it actually working, so I can prove it to you, yep. right? Video didn't happen. So this is in our office in Cincinnati. So there's a room actually moving. So he's navigating with his beliefs and goals, and then the Roomba's circling around there. And then finally it flies over it enough that it could seize it. You see it kind of, I think if you're really quiet, you can hear the theme song. I hope you hear in a minute. Oh, it's a little bit too slow. Oh, there it is. And they're spinning, and it's hard to see the room, but because the room on the bottom is kind of like, oh, there you go. He's spinning around in like a spiral there. And that works. And, and it's so exciting when it actually works. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> so, but anyway, it is a lot of fun. So the next question you're probably asking yourself is what if you have more than one drone, right? 
they can be friends too. Um, and in fact, that we've actually done this in the office as well, where uh, Jim Weirich uh, and I were both working in the same office and we're also into drones. So he has a drone, I have a drone, and then we have an office drone. So <laughs> we, have a, we have a lot of fun. So you can get them to fly together and work together, but there's a little setup that you need to do. I'm just gonna show you, just so you, you're aware and you can do it, and then you can go program it in Erlang. <laughs> so first, you get them on the same network. Uh, you have to get them in a peer network. Uh, and you can actually tell that into it. My drone was totally unsecured, and I'm so glad that you're all very nice. You didn't actually do that, so thank you very much. Um, so you tell that into it, and you can run scripts on it. It's uh, running busy box. Uh, so you just run some configuration script where you assign them, uh, you change the regular network to peer networking, and you assign them all a static IP. So you assign like one, 100, and then you assign the other one 200, and then you can connect on that same ad hoc network with your laptop. Um, you know, say it was like multi-drone ad hoc. And you can change your computer to a static IP. So you can talk to it as well, networking stuff. And then you can fly with them. So um, we actually did this in the office with some beliefs and goals as well, because you want them to have beliefs and goals, of course. Um, this is a video. Play button. Oh, yeah, no, the replay button. There we go. So this is of two drones, and the books on the floor was I didn't have tape that day, and I wanted to give them something to look at. So what they're doing is they're going to see each other, and when they see each other, then they're going to wave to each other. And so then they wave to each other, and then they land. That one likes to wave a lot. So recap, robots are great fun to program. I mean, it really is a joy, and I encourage you all to do it, because it, it's just a joy. Uh, Closure is a powerful and yet simple language, and I think that it's perfect for getting AI work in. And I think that ascribing beliefs and goals to machines can be useful. So um, if nothing else, it's another way, alternative way to think about structuring your programs. That's what you're supposed to get out of your box. And I think that robots communicating and acting with each other, or with, with together, is uh, the future. You know, what, hopefully that's a good future. <laughs> we can work on that together, all of us. So, and that, these are kind of the, some of the resources. My stuff's all out in GitHub, so if you want to play with it and get a drone, you're more than welcome to. There's CLJ Drone, which is a control library for the Drone, and then there's control library for the Roomba, and then there's uh, some of the code that I showed here is the Roomba Drone Friends. And then there's John McCarthy's papers, which I love, and I think that you should definitely read his stuff. There's tons of gems of wisdom in there. So one paper is describing mental qualities in machines, but you should just check out all his papers. <laughs>